Good morning and welcome to this virtual bridge session and it's continuing the theme of copyright and other rights that might come up with regards to uh, remote teaching and learning but also the, the day job as well. And I'm pleased to have with us once again Alan Ray um, who will no doubt introduce himself a little bit. Uh, we will still um, be taking questions of course and um, if you're on the Zoom session then you've got the chat button which should appear as a little bubble with three dots somewhere on your screen. If it's not there you can give the screen a wiggle or a touch and uh, it should come up and by all means put in questions there that we'll deal with towards the end. Uh, well, welcome to make it, uh, making it to the Zoom session indeed that we're holding today and this is going to be the platform that we use. Uh, without further ado, I will hand over to Alan Ray to talk about Blurred Lines. Thanks, um, Jason. I got you right this time. It was Kenji, I think, the last time. Thanks, Jason. Just let me see if I can get this up on my screen. I had it a moment ago. Right. I am hoping that you all see the slides. Are you, control are you, controlling, are you controlling them? Yes, uh -huh. so just, just give me a shout okay. when you need to move. Okay, I'm going to talk this morning with Kenji's assistance about the ownership of copyright, which is a very pertinent topic. It's always a pertinent topic in copyright, and I think it's even more pertinent just now as uh, colleges and educational establishments switch from physical to online teaching and learning. And this is just going to highlight some of the issues. So could you move on, please, Kenji? Right, so I'm not a solicitor. This is, this is the disclaimer slide. Uh, last one, last sentence. Please don't consider any of this as binding legal advice. Moving on. Right, I'm going to deal with what are works, who makes them, and who owns them, because that's the, that's the gist of what uh, ownership's all about. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So there are various categories of works according to the Copyright Designs and Patents Act in the UK, 1988. We've got literary works, we've got dramatic works, we've got musical works, we've got artistic works. Next slide, please. We have got, um, I've put fashion in there, which does come under artistic works, but um, there's a lot of talk about fashion works at the moment. Uh, then we've got uh, broadcasting, video and film recording and sound recording. Next slide, please. And the thing that we have to bear in mind is that what I'm talking about is applicable to all platforms. Things have changed rapidly in copyright legislation since 1988. Uh, they did try to future-proof the Act at that time, with a certain amount of success, I have to say. But... Um, what we're dealing with these days is not just textbooks and photocopiers and, pardon me, heaven forbid, band of machines and gestetners. That was for the oldies amongst us, me in particular. So moving on, please, Kenji. Now, what does a work have to be to be a work? According to our legislation, it has to be original, but the threshold for originality in this country is set pretty low. I think it's set very low in some instances. So originality is, is a concern. It, it has to be recorded or fixed in writing or otherwise. Now, otherwise could be um, a sound recording. It could be just a piece of paper with notation on it. It doesn't matter in writing or otherwise. It has to be permanent. Came across an interesting uh, case while I was researching for this, that ice sculptures do not have uh, copyright because of their lack of permanence, uh, should be created by a British citizen. That's covered to an extent by the various copyright conventions that we've got. So your work in Britain will be covered elsewhere in countries that have signed up to those conventions. It's not to be trivial, whatever the work is, because if it's trivial, it will not uh, gain any kind of copyright. And the real sticky point these days, in America, they, they talk about a work has to be done by the sweat of the brow. Uh, in this country, recent case law would indicate that the judges are moving towards intellectual creation. That's why, in some instances, a work doesn't have to be original in the true sense of it. You know, it's never existed before. A lot depends upon how much intellectual creation you put into uh, the work that you've got might be based on something else. But as I say, 
a lot of that's open to um, discussion. Could I have the next slide, please, Kenji? And again, please. And again. Authors, there's the list. It's not an exhaustive list, but from writers, photographers, right the way down through to publishers of a typographical arrangement, these are people who have an authorial right to the work that they're creating. The last one's going to become really interesting because there's not much case law in it at all. But as AI becomes even more sophisticated and we get more computer generated works, the person who made the necessary arrangements for the work to be undertaken is the person who holds the copyright in that particular work. It's not dissimilar to what it used to be in photography up until, it certainly was from 56 up to 88. Um, it was the person who commissioned the photographer who held the rights, not the photographer him or herself. Moving on, please. Under authorship, we have uh, various categories, uh, and they are confusing, I have to say, uh, and I may confuse you even further. Section 10 of the Act is labelled joint authors. Now, this is applicable in lots of instances in college and universities where people work together and how do they share the rights? Well, the example I've given here, which for those of you with children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, is an exceptionally outstanding book. If you've come across any of the Julia Donaldson and Axel Scheffler books already, um, it, it's a lovely moral tale, absolutely fantastic. But they are considered joint authors because they're collaborating on the same piece of planned work. Now the planned work is important when it comes to joint authorship. Can we move on, please, Kenji? We're now into co-authors. Again, is there a big difference between this and joint authors? So the example I've chosen there is Les Mis, where Victor Hugo uh, created the, um, or contributed the book, and the other people there, Alan Boublil and Claude Michel Schoenberg, contributed the music, and the two were brought together as separate works. To, con to cause Les, Les Miserables. No, it's okay, on you go, on you go. So joint authorship, I've, I've just picked a music video here as an example. Within that music video, you've got eight potential rights. One person could have them all, they could be shared between two people, or they could be shared between eight people. It depends upon what it is that you're doing. So synchronizations, huge business these days. Um, a lot of bands are making substantial sums of money. They're doing a good, good living. If their music is picked up and chosen to be in a cinema soundtrack, if it's chosen to be in an advert soundtrack on television, I mean, some people now freely admit that they write their music for synchronization. They don't write it for sales in the charts. Um, again, could you move on, please? Just again, an example uh, of copyright duration for sole joint and co-authors. John Lennon wrote and recorded Imagine in 1971. He died very sadly in 1980. So the copyright in that work lasts until 2050, 70 years after his death. However, he also partnered uh, Paul McCartney with many, many songs. And if, please be a big if, if Paul McCartney did die this year, their copyright would last until 2090. Uh, the point being that joint and co-authored copyright lasts until the death of the last surviving contributor. So if you've got six or seven people, it's the last one to die, that's when you start counting the, the, uh, the time forward for copyright. Move on please, Kenji. Uh, I've taken this quote from uh, a very good book by Helen Norman. Um, according to the C CDPA of 88, it only provides a starting point when it comes to the author creator. Uh, in many instances, and this is a recurring theme in the rest of my presentation, in many instances, contractual arrangements will be used to determine the matter. Can you move on, please? Right, who's the owner? Well, section 11 of the CDPA determines that, and this is where we start to get into um, college lecturers, and contributors within, within a college um, environment. The author of a work is the first owner of any copyright in it. Fine if that was as far as it went, but it, as ever, it's subject to the following provisions. You move on, please, Kenji. Where uh, a work, 
such as those nominated or a, or a film is made by an employee in the course of their employer, employment, the employer is the first owner of the copyright in the work. Again, you'd think that was fairly straightforward, but the amount of interpretation that that is open to is colossal. I, I will touch on some of it. Can you move on again, please, Kenji? And it's that um, employment, the employer owning the uh, copyright is subject to any agreement to the contrary. Again, move on, please. If you are a copyright owner, you've written a piece of work in a college, in your establishment, whatever it might be, uh, let's, let's put aside the um, actual ownership of it at the moment. It, for my purposes, you are the first owner because you're the author. You can copy the work, you can issue copies to the public, right the way down to the bottom, you can assign or license the work. So all these things you can do. And some copyright owners apply all of these rights if they possibly can. Uh, I keep saying when I, when I do CPD around the colleges, and my diary is uh, open at the moment, thank you very much, um, for future bookings. One of the examples I use is J.K. Rowling, because uh, she, she and her advisors are incredibly astute. She is, uh, in the time that it's taken me to try to get onto this presentation, she's made a few more thousands of pounds with the, the, the royalties of the text, the videos, I can imagine how many times Harry Potter's being watched in lockdown and in quarantine, going through, you know, people buying DVDs and so on. Every time she makes money out of it, as do, as do um, her uh, partners, uh, Bloomsbury, who publish her work, and um, Warner Brothers, who are responsible for so much of the other work that she does. So could we move on again? Copyright owner can do a lot. I'll come back to individual members of staff, I'm not forgetting about them. A very vexatious topic for many people is student copyright. The assumption is made that a college or a university or a school owns student copyright. I would suggest that it doesn't. Uh, I know that Jason has views on this because uh, it wasn't this that I collaborated on, I don't think, a few years ago with just legal, but it was something similar. So can we move on please, um, Kenji? The argument goes, students are not employees, therefore they own their copyright in their works. They may assign or license their copyright to the college or university. They may be asked to do this at the time of registration or matriculation. If that's the case, would they know what they were signing? And again, if they didn't know what they were signing, is there a need for a copyright awareness session? And again, my diary is open for any kind of session that students would like. And I, seriously, I do think that students, are not, are not perhaps as aware as they could be of what happens to the copyright of any, any works that they produce while they are studying in a particular establishment. There's been a lot of talk about this one. Uh, the assumption on many occasions is that the college just owns it, but because the, the, the college is making the facilities um, available to the students, the art studios, the IT studios, the labs, the platforms, all, all that kind of thing. But there is nothing actually specific in the Copyright Designs and Patents Act about this. We are going on the basis of the author is the first owner of copyright. And I do think that some colleges and universities treat their students abysmally uh, about this. Again, I will touch on this later. Can we move on, please? I think this should probably have been the title of that. Go back. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You're very good, but you jumped the gun there. I think this possibly could have been the topic title today. Get it in writing. There is no substitute for this whatsoever. Uh, I spend happily a lot of my time helping many people with copyright challenges. And invariably, it's not it's not educating them and raising their awareness, it's unpicking the problem because they've gone too far. And they're having to work their way backwards because they haven't, this, they haven't got an agreement in writing. Now can you move on please, Kenji? Lecture capture. I was asked if I could touch on this one because the, again, um, in, in this day, and it's difficult during quarantine, obviously, the lecture can't turn up in the, in the lecture theatre in the classroom. But prior to uh, lockdown, 
there was a continuing discussion about the rights of a lecturer if the lecture is recorded to then be put on the VLE. So various considerations. And I know that a lot of lecturers are uncomfortable about their lectures being recorded because they can't put their hands on their heart and say, yeah, all the rights and the content in this lecture, I've cleared them. So it's fine. We can do this. We can put it on the VLE. I'm comfortable in using this. So you got to, might have to revisit that. Who owns those rights? Who owns the works that are being shown? Are they owned by a third party? Images, video, text, music, all the stuff that we use when we're giving lectures. Have, that, have these been cleared with the third party? Another aspect, does the lecturer have any performance rights? Does the guest presenter have performance rights in what they are discussing, displaying, presenting to uh, their audience? You've also got to consider the privacy right because the audience may not want to be recorded. So when you're doing lecture capture, you really should set up an area where your audience are not in line with the camera. And it comes down to uh, release forms, model release forms. Uh, the, other, the last part to consider are the distribution and communication rights. Are you going to put them on the VLE? Okay, that's fine. That might be firewalled. What about putting it on your website? You may have this extremely good presenter, member of staff, or it could be a third party guest, and you think, hey, this is really good. We'll get publicity out of this if we put it on our website. Mm, I'd think seriously about that. Can you move on, please, Kenji? Uh, this came from a, a paper written in the Intellectual Property Quarterly. And again, although it, reply, it refers to musicians, it's important musicians and groups place their legal relationship to each other and the works they create in writing before they begin the artistic process. Now that could just as easily read, it's important that lecturers, university researchers, uh, prospective writers, photographers in groups place their relationship to each other and the works they create in writing before they begin the artistic process. Sit down, think about it in advance. All too often people say, oh, we'll get around to the legalities later. Let's just get on with the, the creative process. And then the creative process is successful and then the arguments start, oh, I contributed much more to this than you did. This is way more important than what you've done. Again, I've got examples of that coming up. Can we move on, please, Kenji? Thanks. The agreements and contracts, they are all around us. Employment contracts, licensing agreements, assignments I'll come to shortly, matriculation with students, third party contracts, joint and co-authorship agreements, full-time, part-time staff, casual staff agreements. And then a really important one, because I got heavily involved in this a few years ago, and no reason to believe it's not still happening, not to the same extent, but I had a heck of an amount of work when at my college we got involved with European funding and there were all sorts of projects came out and who, you know, we, we, we were funded to produce work, produce materials, who owned the rights in it? And it, a lot of colleges found to their cost, they said, oh yeah, we can do this, we can use it. Oh, terribly sorry, you don't have the copyright in it because if you'd read the contract properly, you would realise that you'd actually assigned all the copyright to the European funder. Moving on, please. And again, that's called reinforcement. I'm a teacher. And again, reinforcement. Thank you. Moral rights. <laughs> I will freely admit, move on please, Kenji. I will freely admit to the fact that moral rights are a bit of a dark art as far as I'm concerned. This country has never settled happily with moral rights. In, in the UK, we tend to look more at the copyright of the works from an economic sense, whereas those um, areas, the legislatures such as France in particular, and anything based on the French model, tend to concern themselves more with the rights of the author, droit d'auteur as it's called. Um, and it's, it doesn't sit well in this country, and there haven't been a lot of cases. They do relate to the author, not the work. So you do your work, your work disappears, you've licensed it, you've assigned it, it's not yours. But you do have a moral right, and there are four. The right to be attributed, the right of integrity, i.e. nobody can make derogatory uh, treatment of your work. The right to object to false attribution, so that's a bit 
ghostwriting. If somebody claims that they've written a piece on your behalf or put your name to it. And then the last one, which pops up now and again, is you have privacy in your own domestic photographs and films that are made. Um, can you move on? I think there's another slide coming up on that one. Yeah. You can't assign these rights. They are yours for life, but they can be waived. And a lot of, a lot of, our, a lot of employers, uh, people who want copyright assigned to them will persuade authors and creators to waive their rights. Just put them aside. Don't worry about it. And as I say there again, they don't appear to sit comfortably in UK law. Um, and one of the reasons I think it doesn't sit comfortably is that complainers in this country who want to prove derogatory treatment are, are kind of stymied because we have exceptions for parody, pastiche and caricature, which covers uh, a lot of stuff that goes up on social media. Again, moving on. Thanks, Kenji. Open educational resources, very dear to everybody's heart, I think, that are listening today. Again, move on, please. Uh, most popularly manifested, I think, by Creative Commons and also uh, GNU, uh, which stands for GNU's not Unix, I think, if I can remember correctly. Uh, the traditional copyright statement that we find in the start of so many texts and uh, productions is all rights are reserved. In a Creative Commons, sorry, Creative Commons statement, it's some rights reserved. And I think that the purpose of CC and OER is to make content more freely available for anyone to adapt and share. And I would love to see so many, so much more work being distributed under that form of license uh, as, as all the virtual bridge work is. Moving on, please. I am conscious of time. Um, bear in mind, Creative Commons, it's not a replacement for copyright. It's a form of licensing. The copyright in CC content still exists. So although this will this, this work and all the work that people have done for the virtual bridge uh, will uh, go under a CC license. It's still effectively my copyright. The fact is that I have agreed to it being licensed. You cannot aggregate and label CC uh, content as, as CC. You can't just gather up and say, oh yeah, yeah, we'll just make it creative content. You've got to have the creator's permission for that. Um, because a lot of people say, oh yeah, well, look, let's just stick a CC license on it. No, you can't do that unless you have got their permission, because it is a form of license, just the same as uh, with the CMOs that we deal with, um, uh, collection management uh, organizations. We've, you can't you license your material to them, or license is ma material is licensed to them. Getting confused here. Material is licensed to them, and you've got to conform to that particular license. Next slide, please. Right, we're almost there. Assignment. Can you move on, please? Now, this is where we get back to the um, the employer-employee relationship. The copyright in this country is an ownership right in all those works that we mentioned earlier, that I mentioned earlier. And the ownership of such works allows restricted acts. Again, I mentioned them earlier, the copying, the issuing to public and so on. The owner can authorise these acts by licence. Go back to J.K. Rowling. She can authorise the copies to the public, the making of the videos and so on, by licence. And the owner can also transfer the ownership of their copyright to others. And this is called assignment. Move on, please. Here we come to the, 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 the nub of it for some people. I created the work in my own time. The law argues, and please, this is widely open to interpretation. The law argues that in my own time is not acceptable. Has the work done been done as part of the job the employee was hired to do? This is an argument that many people have constantly. You are known by the job you do, not the hours you work. You go back to the argument, I created the work in my own time. Was that time part of when the creator was doing the job for which they were hired by the employer? So effectively you were taking time out to do something. That's a breach of your employment contract. And is the nature or subject matter of the work so closely related to the type of employment that the line between employment and private time becomes blurred? If you move on, I've got a wee case study here. So me, I'm employed on a full-time basis to do copyright legislation licensing. I write the book in my own time, entitled Copyright and FE. Get the book published without my, pub, without my employer's knowledge, recommend the book to my students and claim all copyright. 
My employer finds out about my book and requests that the text is assigned to them since I could only have written the book using the knowledge obtained during my employment with them and my attendance funded by the college at CPD events such as conferences, seminars and network meetings. Okay, moving on. So I'm still the same lecturer employed to do the teaching and advising on copyright, but again, in my own time, I research, write and illustrate with my own images, a book on the golf courses of the East Coast of Scotland. Very successful, very wealthy. Steven Spielberg's making it into a movie. Does my employer have any claim on this work? Moving on, please. For these reasons, because of the potential confusion, it is important to address copyright in employment contracts where employees are unlikely to be creating copyright works, taken from the Intellectual Property Office. Again, get it in writing, talk about it in advance. You will save yourselves, if anybody's involved in this, you will save yourself immense heartache. If you sit down with your PR, your uh, uh, personnel department, in the college or wherever you work and say, hey, I've got an idea, this is what I'd like to do. Do you have a problem with it? Rather than publish, you can say publish and be damned, but it doesn't always work like that. Move on again, please, Kenji. Um, there's a quote from Jason Miles Campbell. In his Just Legal Days, his exhortation to institutions was to sort it out before even hiring the staff. If you need ownership of the materials, define what and include it in the terms of employment. With students, it might sometimes be within the terms of becoming a student and otherwise an agreement in order to compromise. Moving on, please. Questions. You may have questions, but I've got a few as well. Let's just start you off. Move on, please. What does your contract of employment say? Sadly, Many contracts of employment throughout UK further education, not just Scottish further education, has absolutely nothing to say about intellectual property. Or if it does, it's contained in a line or two. What does your establishment's copyright policy say? If your establishment even has a copyright policy, but that's certainly something that should be in a policy, is the ownership of copyright. And again, I am available for policy writing. How do you treat your part-time staff? And this is a really interesting one because it's changed over the years. It used to be that part-time staff's work was treated the same as full-time members of staff work, i.e. the employer laid claim to the copyright because part-time staff used to be paid for preparation time. And I think that was that's lost deep in the mists of time that that still happens. Um, you must have a contract with them though, or there must be a contract, not you personally, but there must be a contract with them. What's in that contract? How do you deal with contractors and consultants? That, that's a, that's a, a really, really important one. Um, in a case quite close to my own heart a few years ago, our college hired a photographer to take pictures for a prospectus, a print prospectus. Beautiful pictures, absolutely fantastic, job done no contract, job done. And a little while later, some of the pictures started to appear on the sides of buses. They started to appear on bus shelters. They started to appear on billboards. Photographer, not at all happy about this. My contract was to take pictures for the prospectus. I didn't say you could use them on billboards. Long discussion, very long discussions, and an arrangement was come to. Should have been sorted out before the photographer pressed the shutter for the first picture. Um, I don't know why I've said a new work's relevant to the teacher's work. That's just a question. Uh, anything that's, but I think it's that uh, bloodline. Uh, is it, it's what's being created relevant to what the teacher wants to do. Yeah, that's what it is. Um, so it's the, the golf course thing as opposed to the copyright book. What constitutes my own time? Very difficult to determine. And I've mentioned already the lecturer having performance rights. The lecturer does have performance rights. They're not actually part of, um, well, it could be part of their contract of employment. Again, it's something that needs to be looked at. Move on, please. Moral rights have touched on. You can designate your work as Creative Commons if you are the sole uh, author and owner of it. Can you take your work with you? Well, again, that should be an arrangement or an agreement that you have with your employer. Why can't I share my work with others? Depends upon the contract. 
why don't I have a say in what happens to my, to my work? Depends upon the contract. And my employer can't sell my work, can they? Yeah, well, they might well be able to. They might want to monetize what it is that you're doing. Uh, Tin Pan Alley uh, for years probably still exists on the basis that people sitting in cramped offices churn out lyrics and uh, music compositions purely for the publisher to sell. And it was only when a lot of um, uh, lyricists and composers a good few years ago realized that they were getting ripped off blindly that um, they decided, no, I'm not going to work for Tin Pan Alley anymore, I'll do it myself. So yes, your employer can sell your work. Moving on, please. Get it in writing. Moving on. Uh, there is even, I, I was tickled, I was listening to the radio just the other day there, I was tickled, I thought, did that song mention film rights? And it does. Elvis Costello, with my pen and my electric typewriter, even in, my, even in the perfect world where everyone was equal, I'd still own the film rights and be working on the sequel. That was a lovely line. But then Costello's a very clever singer. Moving on, please. We're just about there. Yes, just uh, some cases to think about, about ownership, authorship, and so on. Some really good ones in there. Um, I don't know if the name might not mean much to you, but there was a wonderful case a number of years ago, 1999, over a Guinness advert uh, over the way in which the, the, the film was put together. It was jump cut, and somebody claimed that they had ownership of that, and they, they, got, they, they were proved to be right. Beckington and Hodgins is the, the very famous uh, case brought against the Bluebells the group who rose and fell pretty quickly. Their song, Young at Heart. Uh, Beckington uh, contributed a four bar violin riff. And if you listen to the song, it's instant. You recognize it straight away. Uh, Cogan and Martin, that's a, this is a really interesting one because it's, it's fairly recent. Um, Martin wrote the screenplay to the Florence Foster Jenkins movie. I don't know if any of you saw it about that um, American woman who thought she could sing and couldn't, but uh, nobody had the, the nerve to tell her. But Cogan was Martin's partner, um, live-in partner, I think, and claimed part ownership of the screenplay because she had given advice, she'd done a lot of proofreading and so on, and claimed joint authorship, but got thrown out completely. Uh, Fisher, Brooker and others, that's the, the one about the organ solo at the start of White or Shade of Pale. That goes back into the 60s, but the case didn't, I should have put the case date in, the case was 40 years afterwards. Um, and um, Fisher, who was the contributor of the organ thing, he got the case and he got 40% of the royalty. It'd be worth a bob or two. And then the last one in that list is uh, Hadley Kemp. That's the Spandau Ballet case a few years ago where uh, Tony Hadley and the other members of the band sued Gary Kemp and uh, they lost because they claimed that they had made contribution to joint authorship, but the, it wasn't proved that way. Gary Kemp uh, managed to prove that he had written all the songs. Okay, moving on. Thank you very much. You've been an excellent audience. I have been, am, and hope to continue to be Alan Ray. There... Thank you very much, Alan. Thank um, you. I appreciate we started a little bit late, so we don't yes, have a lot of time, but if there's any quick questions that could come in, anyone like to unmute before I jump in with a question? I'll not be able to answer your question. Well, you could do. Well, I'll answer. Do you think colleges are doing enough, and indeed universities, in order to have the conversation with staff generally? We're, we've moved towards sort of like standardised terms and conditions, and uh, whilst there are obviously people in, in yeah, colleges and universities in a, a non-typical situation, then have we sorted out the situation for the most part for lecturers? No, I don't think so. No, I see too many a lot of colleges and universities have, and you'll know that as well as I do, Jason, because you're more involved with them. Um, my involvement with further education would lead me to believe, no, no, they're not, they're not, near, not doing nearly enough. It, it comes down to um, so many others. It's, it's, it's like everything. Copyright awareness, health and safety awareness, employment relation awareness. You've got to raise that awareness within an organisation. And sadly, Intellectual property does not impact on people. They, a lot of people may not realize, maybe not so much in academia, maybe a little bit, but if you're working for a, a private employer, their whole, their whole production or their whole service that they're providing 
is based on intellectual property. And if you muck it up as an employee, don't um, respect it, don't use it properly, you could cause untold damage. If you release confidential information, somebody eventually releases the Coca-Cola secret formula for making, making the drinks, uh, you, are, um, you are infringing rights, not necessarily copyright. But no, I, I don't think colleges and universities are doing this nearly enough. I think the awareness is very poor and comes back to a point I made in the previous one that I was kindly enough invited to contribute to. Um, we're in a situation these days, compounded a bit by the lockdown, that we're looking elsewhere for works to use in our teaching and learning. And um, without mentioning names, the licensing agencies do do a good job in some ways, but they're not the only ones, as they might have you believe, who can actually provide material. So we've got to look elsewhere. And I think it's important that universities and colleges do consider CC licensing. Um, they do consider other alternative um, resources for teaching and learning. The answer, no, I don't think they're doing nearly enough. Well, thank you very much, Alan. And that brings us to about half an hour. And so with that, I'll wrap up the session. It's been very informative and food for thought. And then perhaps the opening of discussions will result um, on getting a bit more certainty in the relationship between the content creators and the institutions so that uh, both parties can, uh, can understand better who owns the copyright and the materials being created. With that, thank you very much to Alan and the audience that have joined today.